Hello, welcome to Medium Day, or welcome back to Medium Day. My name is Terry, and it's my pleasure to introduce Derek Story, who will be sharing tips for publication editors with us today. Derek is a photographer, writer, editor, podcaster, teacher, and community builder. You'll find links to many of his endeavors in his speaker bio, and I'll be posting some of those in the chat also. I met Derek about 25 years ago when we were on a team that developed online publications for O'Reilly Media. There we worked with hundreds of writers to produce articles for an entire collection of publications. Derek led our editorial efforts there, and that's just one example of his decades of experience in editing and working with writers. I talked him into joining us for Medium Day because I felt like the ability to build a good publishing process is essential for anyone who wants to manage a publication on Medium. So today we'll talk about how he's applied all of his experience to building Live View, a Medium publication of passionate photographers writing about their craft. Welcome, Derek. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. That was very, very nice intro. Uh, Terry didn't tell me her intro that she was going to do before she did it. So. <laughs> I appreciate <Yeah>. that. <laughs> well, let's just dive right into it. Mm -hmm. Before we get into processes, though, uh, could you give us an overall picture of Live View as a publication? I know you're a solo publication editor, which is a little different than some of the other publications we've seen today. So uh, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about the scope of the publication and your purpose and the kind of community that's grown up around it. Oh, absolutely. I love uh, talking about Live View. Uh, as many of you who are tuned in right now, you know, we, we're very passionate about our projects that we do on medium.com and Live View. I had the opportunity to start Live View about a little over a year ago. And I wanted to do a photography publication, but a little different than maybe some of the other pubs you see on Medium in the sense that uh, growing up, I was always a big fan of photography magazines. I just thought, I mean, I used to read them cover to cover to cover to cover, you know, and glean every bit of information out of them that I could. And I wanted to do sort of a photography magazine online. And so we have that kind of publishing schedule. We have a fantastic staff of uh, writers. Every one of them is a terrific photographer as well. Uh, some are travel photographers. Some are street photographers. Uh, you know, just we try to cover uh, as many facets as we can. And we build an editorial list of stories every week. And then on Tuesday morning, depending on where you are, <laughs> uh, we publish that week's slate. And uh, we spend a lot of time with curation and working on the articles. And I'm very proud of everything that goes on the publication. And you can learn about tech. You can learn about uh, the aesthetics of photography. You, you know, we get into other areas. We have so much is related to photography, travel and camping and things like that. So it, it's really fun. And I let the writers write about what they want to write about, because when you're passionate about a subject, I just feel like the articles are more engaging. That's great. Um, you mentioned curation, and I love the idea of a publication editor as a curation of their space and of their topic area. Um, how do you find the writers for the publication? So if you go to medium.com slash live hyphen view, that's our publication. And we don't have a right for me or anything like that. What we have is on the right side, we have a little description. And then in that description, it says, if you want to contribute, if you want to be a writer for live view, it's as simple as just sending me an email. And that's the way the emails come in to go, <laughs> hey, I want to. I want to write for Live View. I, I like what you guys are doing and I want to be a part of it. The reason why, Terry, I do it that way is because I want to have communication with the writer, you know, before they just become a name on the board. And uh, I like to see something they've written. Uh, I want to talk to them a little bit about what they want to write about and maybe help them shape how that fits into our overall publishing agenda and just build rapport because we're very hands-on. I mean, when you become a writer for Live View, you become part of the family. And that becoming part of the family 
starts in the very beginning where we have an introduction and a conversation, and then we go from there. And I do, if you write me about writing for Live View, I will answer your email. <laughs> you will, you will get an answer. You know, I promise you that. That's great. Um, when writers work with you, are they submitting fully finished stories? Are they submitting drafts? What's that process look like once they're accepted into the publication? Yeah, it's it varies with writer to writer, and I like to give them, you know, space in their process while at the same time helping them develop a process because I think process is so important for writing, you know, getting into some sort of beginning, middle, and end. You know, we want that in our articles, but we also want that while we're creating our articles as well. So some writers like to publish drafts ahead of time. We have a separate writers group where everyone hangs out. And sometimes they want to just get it out there and see what the other writers think. And so all of our writers have a chance to take a look at it, comment, and uh, you know, say, hey, did you think of this? Or maybe add that. Uh, other writers, they like to go straight to the draft, submitted draft on the publication and have me look at it. And those tend to be the writers that have been writing for a longer period of time. And they may already have a circle of close, you know, folks that look at their stuff before they go. And if they want to do that, I'm fine with that. Uh, it comes in as a submitted draft. Uh, I take a look at it. All of my writers allow me to make edits without running them back to them. They trust me. And uh, so if I see a little something that needs to be fixed, a typo or something like that, uh, I'll go ahead and fix it. If I have a question about the structure or the content of the article, we get that submission in a couple days before we publish. And that gives me a chance to send them an email and say, hey, uh, I noticed this. Could you give me a little more information about it or could we shape it a little different way? So either way, it's there's a conversation or communication between myself and the writer, but I allow writers to kind of do that as they're most comfortable. Mm -hmm. are, are writers pretty open to being edited or what do you find in working with them on their stories? Mine, the come to us and I don't, I don't know if our group is different or not, they're thankful. <laughs> I mean, they're thankful to have an editor, uh, you know, someone else looking at it. And um, I think a big part of that is that as writers, we've all had something slip through and get published. You know, I was before I was running Live View, I was just uh, a solo writer uh, on Medium.com. I've been on Medium.com for a few years now just a solo writer and I would you know, do the best I could and, and get my stories published a lot of times just under my name, sometimes with another publication. And we've all had that thing where something gets through and we go, Oh no, I can't believe that got through. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's horrible. I mean, that's like, Oh, that's like one of the worst feelings. So I think that the group of writers that are working on live view, they understand that they've probably had that happen to them. What writer hasn't, right? And they appreciate having another set of eyes look at their stuff uh, before it goes through. And they're very open to comments. And sometimes I've had writers go, wow, when you when you first asked me about that, I go, oh, really? You know, and, and maybe we're a little disappointed about it. And then I thought about it. And then I was like, oh, I'm glad he asked me about that. So uh, sometimes the initial reaction might be a little disappointed that it wasn't perfect <laughs> right out of the gate. But uh, in the end, I think they all appreciate having one more layer of of uh, of eyes and thinking and and uh, grammar and all that good stuff. One more layer before you know the button goes live. I think so too. That's been my experience as a writer also. And it's it's such a gift to have that ability to have to work with an editor and and to have um an actual a point of view and and even some resistance on some things that you might need to change or or think about a little bit differently. It's it can be really valuable for a writer to have. 
I agree. And, you know, the nice thing about this is I'm a writer as well. And so I, I know what they're going through, right? I'm not just an editor. And, you know, you know, the funny thing, Terry, is that when we're writing, it's such a tricky endeavor. It really is. And our brain will fill in things that don't show up on the screen, right? Don't show up in the text. And but yet our brain fills it in. And this can be even when you're going back over it, your brain will <laughs> not only fill it in once, yeah. but it'll fill it in over and over again. And if you don't have that fresh set of eyes, uh, I think that uh, those things can slip through. And one tip that I have for my writers, and I and I ask all of them to do this, uh, not only if you can have someone else look at it even before it gets to me or before it gets to us, but I encourage all of my writers to play their article out loud, have the computer read it to them. The, the voice that medium.com has is excellent, but uh, even our computers have that built-in functionality because it's interesting to be watching your article with your eyes and be hearing it with your ears and you go, you know, that doesn't sound quite right. Or I got that tense wrong. Or, wow, that's kind of an awkward turn of phrase now that I hear it. So listening to your articles before you submit them for publication, I think is, and I like to do that near the end, right? So I'm not immune to it. So I'm not sick of it. <laughs> you know, uh, doing that before it goes to the next step, I think is super important. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um we have a question uh, in the Q&A from David Litwin, who says, Medium doesn't have a social community process for us to interact with our publication writers. How do you connect with your writers on the daily to keep you top of mind? Yes, and there have been discussions that Medium is thinking about, you know, making that part of the publication process. But David, you're right. Uh, right now, we don't have that. And so I use a separate uh, platform for that. I actually use uh, Mighty Networks, uh, which is a, a very nice platform, very clean platform. Uh, I use it for my workshops as well. And so I have a writer's group on Mighty Networks. So when you become, uh, when I add you to the author's list for Live View, I, I actually also invite you to our Live View group on, on Mighty Networks. And there, that's where we have the conversations. We can set up separate Zoom meetings and chat with each other. Uh, we try to do that uh, every now and then. I think my writers want me to do more Zoom meetings than I do with them. Uh, and I appreciate that. But uh, we do have those. And it just gives us a chance to communicate outside of Medium and coordinate. And, and I like it a lot better than email threads. I think sometimes we all get a little weary of email threads and, you know, this is a nice interface and it, it works very well. That's great. Thank you for the question. Um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q and a section. Uh, you'll see that down below. We may not see it in the chat. We can't, we can't um, present and, and keep a close eye on the chat as much as we'd like, but we'll keep an eye on the Q and a. And, um, We'll and do, we're, we're open to questions. To, we we yeah, like questions. Yeah, <laughs> we've left plenty of time for questions. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We hope to mostly make this a uh, question and answer. And if we if we finish up early, we'll give you time back to prepare for your next session. So mm -hmm. um, I see one here. Uh, Lachelle asks, I've been asked to bring a well-written paragraph to the beginning of my story and hesitated because I was concerned it would change the focus of the article. Without a lot of context, I'm wondering if this speaks to improving overall writing. Is there a mentor process through Medium to improve our craft? I love the editing process. Um, and I think I, I can speak to like in terms of Medium features, I think publication editors are really the, the functionality we have for that. But in terms of, of the actual process, I'll let, I'll let Derek answer that part. It's it's a good question in the sense of you know what's important when you're preparing your article uh, for and this is whether it's on Medium or anywhere else, but the things so vital uh, your title super important 
your subtitle, and especially on uh, Medium, the subtitle is almost as important as the title itself. And you, and you need to have them both, and you need to know how to format the subtitle, you know, that goes right below with the small t, right, in the, in the format bar. And then uh, an image, because an image will accompany uh, your article, and then your opening paragraph. And your opening paragraph needs to be strong. Now, we're not strictly journalistic in the sense that you have to do who, what, when, where, why in the opening paragraph because we're, we're not we're not forcing people to write inverted pyramid because we're not going to cut their article in half halfway through because it won't fit on the page. But uh, the opening paragraph needs to be engaging and it needs to be honest. And what I mean by honest, it, it needs to be an honest lead for what's going to follow. What is going to follow beyond that so the reader needs to have faith when they read our headline and they read the subtitle and they read the opening paragraph, they need to have faith what's going to follow is in alignment with that. With that. And so probably 60% of my comments on any article has to do with the headline, the subhead, and the opening paragraph to make sure those are great. And it's funny, once you get those in alignment, the rest of the article just seems to flow easier, right? <laughs> because you're clear, you're clear in your head as to what's going to happen, right? Now you're clear, and once you're clear, then you can uh, bring that to the rest of your article. That's great. I think uh, we see that on Medium a lot that the strong, strong title, subtitle, and story um, image that it is in alignment with the actual content is um, super important. Thanks for the question, Michelle. Um, we have a question from Lucy. Is live view appropriate for a writer who happens to love taking photos, but not a professional photographer in any manner? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, Lucy, we love that because I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, professionals tend to specialize in certain areas. Fantastic, right? But really what makes them professional is they're doing it for a living. If we get someone who's not a professional but loves photography, uh, I think there's a little bit more passion a lot of times associated with that. And I also think the fun thing about writing for Live View or just writing in general about photography is exploring because you get, okay, let's say your first three articles are, you already had those inside of you, right? There are things that you already love and are writing about. So you get your first three articles out and things are going well and we're all happy. And then you go, but what am I going to write about now? Okay. If you're an amateur or a passionate photographer and enthusiast photographer, as we call them, then you're going to start looking around like, oh, well, what about this? What about that? And then you're going to explore things that maybe the professional doesn't have time to do. And that exploration and what you find, and then you bring that back and write about it and share it, that's exciting. So we love that. We love that a lot. Great, thank you, Lucy. Um, our next question here is from Corey Goodwin. And Corey asked, to my knowledge, there's no direct monetary reward for being a publication editor. Could you explain the benefits of taking on the challenge of editing a publication? <laughs> well, you know, Corey, we could expand that to being a writer too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, this is not something you do to make a lot of money. You're, you're absolutely right. But uh, I think there's, there's something to be said for being a part of something that is growing and successful. And I think, one of the one of the things that's tough about being a writer, and we see this with photographers too, is that they feel isolated uh, in their craft. In other words, uh, you take a great picture and you show it to friends and family and they go, Bob, that's beautiful. That's great. And then that's the end of it, right? There's nothing like, wow, how did you get that angle? Or, you know, you know, that exposure is really interesting or whatever. You don't get any of that. You don't get that camaraderie. And, and that being with birds of a feather. When you're the member of a publication or when you're running a publication, you know, you get to be, you know, the leader of all this, right? So uh, 
uh, not only do you get the camaraderie, but you get to say, hey, let's go over here and let's try this or let's do that. And to have that shared experience, like a team sport, to have that shared experience, I find so much more satisfying than just being stuck all by yourself in the corner of a room trying to you know, figure out what to do next. So I would say that it keeps me motivated. It, uh, it keeps me excited about it. Uh, I, I've made new friends. I, I mean, these writers are, are lifelong friends. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to it that go beyond money. I think too, um, I, I'm not so sure so much with you. I know you do a lot of photography workshops and you have your own photography community. And I, there are other publications that run various types of workshops and it's, it's, it kind of builds awareness of them as an entity off of medium as well. Um, have, are you seeing any, anything like that with writing on medium or running a publication or is that really not been the case so much? With no, you? that's a real thing. Uh, I mean, uh, being able to say that I'm a publication editor for medium.com. That's nice. <laughs> I like that, you know, and um you know, I think Terry, you and I talked a little bit about this, which is just a little bit of a side path here. But a lot of my writers have said to me, I've been writing for a long time. I've been writing on my own blog and maybe 20 people see my articles and they're good articles. I work hard on them and I'm a good writer. I joined Live View and now I have 200, 500, 1,000 people or more seeing my articles. And they're the same articles that I was publishing before and no one was seeing them. And so now I can say, uh, I have something to point to where there's a lot of claps, uh, where I'm part of a publication that has other good writers. And so suddenly I think it just elevates everything for you as a writer, instead of just trying to do it on your own all the time, now you're part of something and now we have momentum. And I think medium in general is fantastic for that. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about is don't get too caught up in the money side of it. In other words, you know, I'm going to write for medium to make a bunch of money. Uh, I, I think that's probably not the best way to go for a lot of reasons. But if I'm going to write for medium to elevate my status as a writer, I think that's very legit. Thanks for that, Corey. Um, next up, I think we can kind of combine these two questions a little bit. Yeah. One is from Lori saying, Derek, can you share what type of submissions you typically receive on Live View in terms of topics or features? And then Coral is asking, is your site about using specific cameras or is it combining travel photos, story based on travel pictures slash videos, et cetera? Yeah, I think we can combine those. So uh, when you go to Live View, you'll see that we have uh, subtopics. So we have Live View itself. We have a front page, which is the latest stories. And then I'll read you the subtopics right now. So we have street photography, travel, gear and reviews, essays, software and computer, and then insight. And insights really, um, that's an open category for wow, I just discovered this thing, whatever it happens to be, and I want to share it with you, you know. But um, as you'll see, uh, both Lori and Coral, uh, we're pretty broad, and we don't try to force anyone into any particular categories at all. Uh, what we want to do is have them bring us their passions and their interests and then add that to the mix. And if we don't have a category for you already, Trust me, we'll find a, we'll find a place for you <laughs> if it's an interesting topic. So we're pretty wide open. Now, I do like variety. You know, I do like having, like, we have a couple travel photographers that are fantastic. And at some point, they're going to come home. And <laughs> then I gotta go, <laughs> I'll be sad. Oh, don't you want to take another road trip? Uh, because <laughs> it's great having them all over the world. I have my our, our main street photographer, Fernando. 
he's got a regular job, you know, he's, and he's like working, working, working all the time. And yet he finds a way to get at least three excellent street photography articles out a month. That is a, that's a tall order, you know, but that's his passion and that's what he loves doing. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I think that is kind of a high frequency for writing uh, in-depth stories. What What's typical for writers that you see, or do you have any advice for what writers should be shooting for? I do have advice in this because I think uh, regularity is super important, you know, to honing your craft. I think the ideal is two articles a month. I, I If you can produce two quality articles a month, uh, I think that is that is good that is very good and you will progress as a writer you will build audience good things will happen one article a month is is very acceptable not bad at all you won't build audience quite as quickly uh things will happen a little slower but you still have that consistency and i think part of it terry is how long does it take you to write some writers are very fast right they get an idea do a little research. They have an article two hours later, let it sit overnight, read it again the next morning, and they're ready to go, right? So they're lucky. Uh, a lot of articles will sweat over every paragraph for a week, a week and a half. And so it, and neither is, is better than other in terms of the final outcome. It just depends who you are. So you have to take into account your own process in this but you want to get two a month if you can one a month minimum don't stretch it out longer than one a month oh, that sounds great um we have a question from melinda fargo on what is the first thing you would do to publicize a brand new publication so what we did with live view first of all uh, terry knows this because she's been in the trenches for a long time the hardest thing in the world to do is start a new website or start a new publication. It's just, you know, it's just, ah, uh, that, that first couple of months is tough. Uh, just because it starts slow. It's a snowball, right? And then the snowball gets bigger over time, but in the beginning, it's pretty small. So the thing that I think is really important is that I bring in, what we did with Live View is I brought in the writers. We had a core group. And uh, the number one thing is, to get the quality content going and then have them promote the publication to their own audiences and their own communities. I think that's super important. I think the second thing when it, and this is medium specific, is to get as much quality content in there early as you can so that you can have articles uh, have wider distribution. And when you get an article with wider distribution, you're going to get it in front of more eyes, and then they're going to come into Live View. So uh, a lot of this just hovers around quality, getting as much quality in the beginning, trying to get it out there and, and get more people looking at it. Then they will come to the publication, and then the publication will begin to gain some momentum. But it's, I mean, whether you're an individual writer or your publication, the first 500 followers are the toughest. Once you get to that 500 mark, it goes faster. But you, you know, you're going to have to grind to get to 500, and then after that, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll be easier. But it all comes down to quality and getting it out there. Hopefully, you'll get them boosted and have other people look at them, and uh, and then they'll come, they'll gravitate towards your pub. Yeah, I never never thought about it quite like that but it makes sense because when you're just starting to try to get a relationship with readers they really want to know what to expect and they want to have a reason to to follow you and to see yeah. more so um and sometimes I, I, i'm seeing how you could build a strategy around that yeah and sometimes you know they they will come to the publication 10 times before they follow you you know you mm -hmm. don't usually get them right away uh, you know, they. I think at some point they go, oh, well, you know, I feel like I'm, I've been here a lot. Maybe I should just follow them. <laughs> you know, they're, <laughs> they're, it, it's really interesting that the whole getting, building that momentum is, is, is just, it's repetition, it's consistency, it's quality content. 
and it's patience. And you just have to stay at it. Now, I do do things outside of Medium on other platforms. So, you know, like, for instance, on Threads, I'll use the friend link. And on Threads, just to get people coming in and, and you know, and take a look at it. And then hopefully to get them to sign up for Medium and, and follow Live View. I will do that from the outside. But I will tell you that going outside of Medium the uh, the percentage of 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 people who will stick, the percentage is smaller than if they're already in medium. And really, what you want to do is go after those folks. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think uh, for any of you that aren't familiar with the friend link, it's a way for you with your own stories to uh, send a link out that somebody doesn't see the paywall. Um, though that anybody can read the story so that's available to you it doesn't hurt your earnings and uh, it's a great way to to share your work on medium it is and um you know sometimes uh an article will catch fire because it does show up on facebook or something and then people start passing around out there and then and then suddenly you start getting a lot of reads so good things can happen when people start reading your articles. Yeah. Um, we have a question from John Great. Um, do you do poems on live view that have a photo? I think this is kind of a photo in poem format. Is that something you do on the publication? We don't have that right now, but mm -hmm. if you have something interesting to show me, I'd like to see it. Uh, I think the thing that I would say is to that, if we were having that conversation, John, is uh, is this something you do consistently, right? Is this because that could be interesting to have something like that as a feature, uh, you, you know, that shows up a couple times a month, you know? Um, so I just because we're not doing it doesn't mean we're not interested in doing it. Yeah. I would imagine, um, do you have any advice for, for editors who might want to experiment with, with formats like that? I mean, how do you decide that that would be something you would want as an ongoing feature and whether it, um, how do you decide whether it's working for your audience or not? Yeah. So it is something that you have to follow and track, right? You know, are you getting, are people responding to it? But I think even before that, is it ha I have to be interested in it, right? So the photo and what follows, you know, if it's poetry or short prose, whatever it happens to be, they need to work together really well. Because as we all know, as writers, if, if you are only using 15 words to convey a thought, as opposed to 1500 words, those 15 words have to be really good. So, you know, I'm looking my, this, this has to be compelled. I have to be compelled uh, by it. And then um, I will follow it. And then I will follow it. And in what I mean by that is see how it does, see if it's building up any sort of following, see if others are interested in it. But mm -hmm. um, it sounds, I mean, you know, you go oh, a photo in 15 words or a photo in 25 words, easy. No, that is, that is, that is, a, you, that's something that you've got to be good uh, to make that work. <laughs> got to be really dense to get yeah, it across. Yeah, you've got to be amount. good. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, I love how you pointed out that it has to resonate with you mm -hmm. also personally, because I think that's one of the strongest parts of a good publication is that editorial point of view and voice that comes through. Um, and again, that's that's the editor as a curator of that space. Yeah, and it, we learned this in the early days of the web. And, you know, Medium is a microcosm of the web, right? There is a lot happening on there, a lot of articles, a lot of stuff. And so one of the things that I learned when I was working at O'Reilly Media is that actually it was taught to me by Tim, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I learned it. I actually listened to him 
is that <laughs> it <laughs> did that, happen once in a while <laughs> it does happen it does happen is that uh you know the world wants filters right they want filters and when you find a filter that works for you then you know then that saves you time and so, so you don't have to look at a million things and the analogy we used to use was um film critics right uh so uh we were back in the ebert and roper days or whatever if you liked their taste in movies then you could watch their show and then you know the next four or five movies you want to see or don't want to see right depending on what it is but they served as a filter for all the movies that were out there that you know you had a hard time telling and and that i think the publication editor for that publication uh serves that same role so i am filtering and and trying to put something together and if you like the way that i do that then hopefully you'll you you should like live view um if you don't like the way that i'm doing that then you're probably going to go somewhere else but that is our job to be a filter uh for all sorts of things good writing interesting writing the breadth of it all that right such a great point and there there's a lot of great photography on medium also i think mm -hmm. um there's a full frame there are photographers posting there's a really good ecosystem so you can really pick and choose who you follow to get the the point of view that you like and that makes it really important a, just a general anything goes photography publication is too broad to to do really well on the platform, I think, in that respect. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the world of photography is booming right now, and we've got so many different angles. Uh, one thing that we talk about a lot is is smartphone photography, because its evolution is, is mm -hmm. wickedly fast right now. And there's a lot of interesting things. And it's not just wickedly fast in terms of, okay, now it's more computational than ever, you know, and all you have to do is point and shoot. Yeah, there is all that. But what's happening is there's a response to that or, you know, the pendulum swings mm -hmm. both ways over time. And now people are starting to do things with their smartphones or the iPhone or Google Pixel, whatever it happens to be, that's more film-like or that's they're bypassing the computational or they're doing other things with it and they're experimenting and they're finding interesting stuff to do. So that world is very rich right now, uh, and that's an interesting subject. So we consider smartphone photography a legitimate uh, discussion point, and some of our uh, authors only shoot with their smartphone, especially the travel ones. You know, they uh, and I'll tell you, their pictures are good. <laughs> and you know we we demand good pictures to go with the articles and they are they are very good so it's ex it's exciting there's a lot of stuff going on we try to to filter that great um i wanted to go to this question from vanessa jones um she has a question when you Say, try to write two articles a month. Is it okay to publish them to different publications and have them be on different topics with separate following? Or do you mean all in one niche? And um, my guess is that this is one of those it depends answers, but uh, I'm curious if you have any advice on that. Yeah. From like the writer pub. Yeah. It does depend. You know, we, we certainly don't want to, you know, make your world overly narrow. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> it, I strongly believe that, um, okay, here's another, uh, this is going to be my second O'Reilly quote in one talk. So this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that, uh, another thing that I learned in the early days was it doesn't matter how big your niche is, as long as you dominate it, you know, and you will be successful. And what I mean by that is I think it's better to work uh, as a as a little bit more of a specialist or within a window or a niche of your writing, because uh, one of the things that we pay close attention to, what are the key words or tags that you apply to every article? Uh, make sure, uh, you know, I have them hit certain tags over and over and over again, so that uh, so that when it's searched, 
you know, there's a good chance that not only one of your articles will come up, but a number of your articles will come up. And so I think it's also easier to build a following, uh, a dedicated following if you're writing within a niche or an area of expertise. So even though it's great to cover everything, and you know, we know some very popular writers on Medium that just cover everything, and they have uh, a lot of followers, chances are they started in the early days of Medium. You know, always good to be on the ground floor. But I think generally speaking for most writers, I think it's better to kind of focus on an area, at least in the beginning, and uh, get your get your audience uh, behind you. Makes sense. Um, I have a question here from Lachelle on, is there a recommendation in terms of maximum length or reading time to adhere to? So what we follow, what we recommend, is something also uh, that fits uh, with what the editors are looking for when they're thinking about wider distribution. And that is, uh, you know, you really do want to get up around 1,200 to 1,500 words. Now, that doesn't mean adding words when, you know, there's nothing to say. That means a solid twelve to 1,500 words. We, we have just found that articles that that reach that length have a bit more success than the shorter ones. Hard for me because I like a good 750 word article. That's what I like writing, you know. So sometimes mm -hmm. I have to to battle uh, that, you know. And sometimes I just say I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to write it anyway. <laughs> but um, uh, as you're thinking about building. Uh, your reputation and getting as many eyes on your work as possible. Twelve to fifteen hundred words, I, I would say, is what you want to shoot for. Great. Do you happen to know offhand how that uh, translates to estimated read time and number of minutes on Medium? You want to hit five minutes or more? Five minutes. Five. Yeah, to seven. I was going to yeah. say it's probably like three minutes and seven minutes is the, yeah the different lengths that we see often. Yeah. 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 Five to seven is if you're hitting five to seven, you're, yeah. you're in good shape. I, um, I write, I don't write inside the medium, uh, mm -hmm. tool. I write outside of it and then I bring it in. And, and, uh, so I, I have word count and all that stuff available to me already. And uh, I'm writing on a Mac and I use iWriter Pro and I like it because it's nice, clean text mm. editor, um, you know, and word counts, one of the things that I get. And it's funny, uh, you know, while we're talking about this. So usually, let's say I hit my 1500 words that I want to hit. Uh, usually my first draft is only mm, 11 or 1200 words. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I let it sit. And here I think I've written this beautiful thing and then I go back and read it again. And, uh, so many gaps in this thing. And then, uh, so then I'm going back and I'm shoring it up, filling in the gaps and stuff. And then it gets to around 1500 words around the second or third draft. And you notice I said second or third drafts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is not a one draft game. This is uh, probably three to four drafts, you know, you want. And, and as you continue to, to say, okay, I need to support this thing I just said, Okay, there'll be another 150 words, you know, things like that. And, and then you'll get there through subsequent drafts. Um, I have a question here from Attila. As a publication owner slash editor, do you aim to only accept high quality stories, boost worthy, and reject everything else? Or do you allow for stories that you know up front you won't be nominating for boost? Also, how do you normally deliver a rejection to the author? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, I go through this as a writer because sometimes I just want to write stuff that I know has no chance of being boosted, <laughs> you know? And so, but I say, you know what? I really want to write this. And so I will write it anyway. And then I'm glad that it's in my resume. Uh, on medium i feel that same way about um our writers now the thing that i want to clarify though in your question is 
it still has to be high quality. You can have a high quality piece that's not boostable, right? And so mm -hmm. it still has to be good writing. You still have to, it has to be clear in its thinking. Um, you know, it still has to maybe have a little bit of passion to it. Just because it's a good piece doesn't always mean that it's a piece that can be boosted. I want good pieces, whether they're boostable or not. I just want good, you know, writing that's going to engage our readers. And I have one writer, I'm not going to say who this person is on our staff, who I love the writing. <laughs> I love every article that comes through from this writer. And very few of them are boostable and very few of them get boosted. And I am so happy to have this writer on our team. Mm -hmm. Because the stuff is good. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, the second part of this question is how to deliver rejection. Is that something that, that you, that you have to do? And how does, how does that pan out for you as a, as a publication editor? Not often do I have to reject something because we've already gone through a little bit of a process before you became a live mm -hmm. review writer. Sometimes there's this thing, it's kind of a war of attrition sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, what I mean by that is the first draft is not close. And so then you need to write a second draft and there's things to do. And then the second draft is a little closer, but still not there. Third draft still may not be there. And um, I'm willing to hang with it as long as the writer is. But sometimes writers just, they give up at that point. You know, they go, either they'll publish it themselves or publish it somewhere else or something like that. So sometimes they get worn out. But I have to tell you, that's, that's rare. You know, um, most, if you become a writer for Live View, chances are, you're you're never going to have an article rejected. You might have to work on it a bit more, but chances are very good it'll never be rejected. Mm -hmm. Um, a question here from Neva Nasi about any tips for growing a community of contributing writers for writers starting their own publications for the first time. So I think this is for a new publication editor mm -hmm. on Medium. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very exciting time, that that beginning. Um, when I first had the opportunity to do Live View, I, th I thought a lot about that. And uh, I, I thought, okay, job one is to find writers, you know, my core group of writers to start with. And I think a lot of times we know people and we try to talk them into joining us. So, uh, now, only a fraction of the writers I asked to write for Live View were already medium.com writers. And so I had to bring them into the, the fold and mm -hmm. have them be a member and all that stuff. But I started with just trying to get that core group together. Um, and, and you can approach other writers that are on medium.com. You know, if you see someone, you go, wow, this this person is writing about what I want our public or would be a good contributor for our publication. Send them a private note. I mean, it's very flattering as a writer when you receive a note saying, I'm starting this thing or we already have this thing going and I'd like you to consider being part of it. That, that feels good. And so don't be afraid to contact writers and say, hey, I think you would, you would be good for this and I would love to talk to you more about it. Uh, I think there are so many good writers on Medium that if you if you don't know writers outside of there, they're there in there, and it's just a matter of you talking to them and trying to pull together that core group. Once you get that core group, then start publishing, and then all the other things will start to happen. That's great. Um, we'll be posting some more links in chat, including some a uh, link to our health center on publications. So if you're just getting started with publications and you'd like to be a publication editor, there'll be a link there to help you get started with that. Um, I see a question here from Lori Andrews, and I'm not sure how much you can speak to this, Derek, but 
uh, she asks, if you submit a photo with a historical basis with accompanying story, are there any issues that need to be considered with regard to copyrights for using a photo? And I think like the, the quick answer is yes, there are issues, but I'm, I'm not sure um, if we could answer it fully within the scope of this, but. If, you know. Right. I mean, this is where we start out with saying, I'm not a lawyer, not allowed to give <laughs> right. <distribute> legal advice, <laughs> but uh, we, we do have some common sense things. Um, we run into this all the time. Uh, this is a very common issue. And if I, I think the first place to start, if you can, is with Creative Commons and, and finding um, there's a whole wealth of, uh, there's a whole inventory online of uh, images that have the Creative Commons license that would allow you to use it for editorial purposes. And Creative Commons license different ways you know they have different you know with attribution da, 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 they got about 12 different ways but for editorial use creative commons is a good place to start there's a lot of resources that allow you to use photos for historical purposes or for historical photos for editorial purposes but you do have to research how, you know what what the rules are for that photo the thing to be careful about is that certain estates, uh, you know, famous photographer estates uh, are very picky about licensing. And so just don't assume that you can use an Avedon photo in your article because it's 20 years old. Uh, that estate is very active, for example. So you just have to find the rules, you know, for that photo. And it is something that you have to be aware of. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. We're going to close with enough time to give everybody a chance to have a break before the next session. This has been a long one. Um, and this one's from Corey. Uh, do you ever generate ideas and issue a call for submissions? Do you ever do like a theme call for submissions on live view? I, I haven't had to. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I think I'm very... I think I'm very fortunate that way, right? Because they're, they're so excited. But, you know, one thing I will say to that is that that's where our offline group is very, uh, very helpful because, uh, you know, sometimes ideas come out of those conversations or sometimes people go, do you think people would be interested in an article on infrared portraiture? You know, and they'll go, no, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, then they'll go, but maybe this would be uh, interesting to them. So, um, you know, I think our offline community helps with that. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't suggest we have photo assignments and stuff that we do in other groups, but not for our live view group. They, they seem to be uh, percolating just fine. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I, I think it's it's an interesting question that I have another view into Derek's photography community because I'm a member of that. And there there's there is a, a themed call for photos uh once a month and there's mm -hmm. there's a theme and that's really fun. Um so I see how that can work in a community. Um and I appreciate how you've you've chosen that experience for one type of context, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. not for the live view context as well. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, honestly, Terry, I would be surprised if our writers go, I, I just can't think of anything to write about. Right. <laughs> right. Um, like, oh no, the, the zombie. It's a lot different to write when you're pushed, you know, as yeah. an assignment, you yeah. know, even if it's a prompt. Exactly. So, it can work in some ways, but uh, not in others, maybe. Derek, thank you so much. I think we're going to go ahead and close and give everybody a chance to take a break. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Um, please do check out the links in the chat. I'm going to paste those in again, uh, just so they're handy. And um, you can find Derek at all of these places and live view and we'll see you again. Thank you so much, Derek. Absolutely. And send me email uh, in, in just generally speaking, do whatever you need to do to keep writing and writing consistently. And I promise you good things will happen. <laughs>